Uh, my name is Rami Alayan. I am a design lead at IBM during the day. At night, I transform into a filmmaker. <laughs> I lead double lives. Um, and uh, uh, I often find parts of my kind of film practice seeking ways into my design practice. Uh, it's not working? Closer. OK. All right. Um, so yeah, so a lot of times what I do in film finds its way into what I do in design in, in kind of not so obvious ways. Um, so I kind of decided to kind of try to formalize that a little bit. Um, fundamentally, designers and filmmakers, they approach things in similar ways. Both of them are focusing on this idea that it's not just about the what, but it's also about the how. Uh, so there's a lot there that's in the translation between kind of the content and the way it's presented, the functionality and the way it's experienced. And in this case, you know, in user experience design, it's of course about the users, and in film, it's about the audience and how they experience something. In this clip, from Schindler's List, there's a guy looking at something. You notice a girl wearing red. She's the only red spot. She's also walking in an empty space in the center. you notice the direction of her motion is different from everybody else. He's looking a little bit to the left now. The camera is panning left. We're following the girl who's also walking left. She's again the only one in red. The camera pans left even more. We're following the same direction. We're being manipulated to follow to this spot where she appears again. This time she's walking in the reverse direction. Reverse from everybody else. That makes her more noticeable. Okay, he's now back to his eyes, which we're drawn to. Now his eyes are on the right-hand side of the frame for a reason. He cuts to an image where the girl is also now on the right-hand side, making it easier for us to spot her. She's walking now left at the same pace and in the same direction as everybody else, raising a question, is she gonna say, face the same fate as these people? Possibly what's happening to these people getting executed in the front. That was a very, very, very quick scene analysis <laughs> of this sequence from Schindler's List. Um, so I'm going to go through a little bit of what it is to do scene analysis and what are these various visual elements that directors very consciously put in place in scenes. Um, and then I'm going to get into a step back and looking, how can this be adapted to user experience? And in a way, I'm reflecting on how I've been using it for the last 10 years. There we go. So in the last year or so at IBM, I've been tasked with designing a user uh, or UX review process for the entire uh, IBM cloud organization. We're talking about tens of products, tens of reviews, agile process. So I'm part of the review process. I'm also part of giving feedback to teams. But I'm not a domain expert on any one of these products. We're talking tens of products. Um, there are different kinds of um, uh, design support for these products. Some are completely designed by developers with no design background. Some are fully designed by designers. Um, so when you see something very quickly with very little time to prepare or really understand the domain, how can you give feedback based on what you see and be useful? Um, and how do you know what you're looking at where there was something that was well thought out by a designer and you don't need to spend that time questioning versus something that was very almost haphazardly put together by development, and you need to question every little detail of it. So scene analysis, or mise-en-scene in film, it's literally placed in the scene. It's French. Um, it's the idea that directors are making very conscious visual decisions about everything in the scene. And in doing so, they're communicating the character, the story, the mood. But also, like we saw, they're manipulating our eyes and our attention to what's dramatically relevant. So with mise-en-scene analysis, the idea is that you see what's there, you see the choices that have been made, and you try to read backwards into what was the director thinking. Is that consistent with what I understand about the story and about this film? You don't need to study the full script. You don't need to study the full film. You might just have an idea, a synopsis. And that's generally enough to interpret a scene. Elements of mise-en-scene, it's hard to hold these two things together, sorry guys. 
Uh, <laughs> um, color. This is a scene from The Sixth Sense, a funeral where there's a character conspicuously dressed in red. That already stands out as weird. A few minutes later, you realize that she's the murderer of the deceased character. That's not a random choice. The director is trying to tell us something before it actually happens. Size on the screen. The movie The Favorite, I don't know if you've seen it, it's still playing. The queen is in the back, and she's significantly smaller on the screen than her assistant, who looks much more fierce, much more powerful up front. This is already establishing the dynamic between them, what's happening in her room, as, as opposed to what happens outside in front of the public. Placement. Where characters are relative to each other, but also in the, in the, in the, in the scene itself. On the right-hand side, a scene from A Separation, where the two characters are literally separated from each other because they're about to get a divorce. On the right-hand side, two different characters from the same film sitting next to each other or opposite to each other. That already tells us something about the relationship. Distance. This might seem arbitrary when you say, okay, if characters are closer to each other, then they're probably more of buddies or lovers or very further apart, then they are less so. But distances are not arbitrary. They're very well thought. Take an example, Neon Bull up here. These two are kind of potential lovers, but she's pregnant. So there's something between them that's not quite working. <laughs> Framing is not arbitrary either. If you're close to a character, their movement is heightened. In Run Nula Run, she's running. She's trying to catch her boyfriend before he commits a crime. With this framing, she looks like she has a chance of catching him before he does, it, before he does anything. Um, on the other hand side, here, I promise you anarchy, a character, he lost contact with his lifelong friend in Mexico City, and he's walking back to the city in this huge frame. His movement is so insignificant. The whole thing is hopeless. There's no way he's going to find his friend because his friend actually moved to the US and he doesn't know it. Movement. Our eyes obviously get drawn to movement. You know, cars could be moving back and forth, but if there's one character that's not moving in the same way, we're drawn to this character. But also, just general movement. Anything that's moving faster than anything else or slower than other anything else, we're drawn to it. Composition is a big deal. Orson Welles in Citizen Kane, he uses these very weird compositions where there's always an oblique angle and a line that's going sideways, making the image look a little bit unstable. Because by the end of the film, the whole world of Citizen Kane is going to collapse. So this whole instability is implied from the very beginning. There are always cliches and things we, we see and recognize. A gun, we know that that's dangerous. I don't think I've ever seen a movie where a gun appears that it does not get fired, at least at some point during the film. Eyes, we're always drawn to eyes. We're humans, we recognize eyes, we want to know whether this is somebody who's going to attack us or who's somebody who's a friend to us, who's going to interact with us. We're always following eyes, and where eyes look is very important. We follow them. Also, there are genre cliches. If you're watching, it follows, and you see the characters with their back to such a hallway. <laughs> you know something creepy is going to come up. Camera angles. Looking at a character from above, they look vulnerable. Looking at them from below, they look powerful. And of course, <laughs> in Kill Bill, Tarantino likes to mess with us. He gives us a character who looks very, very friendly, but he gives her this low angle, all these oblique lines in the back. You know, she's badass. <laughs> Next scene is not going to go well. Okay, so how do you read a scene? It's actually fundamentally very, very, very simple. First, you figure out what you're looking at. Characters, props, locations. Interpret what that is. Then you think of what is it that you're noticing first, because that's what the director wants you to see first. Okay? This could be because of size, central placement, color, any of these things, movement. Then you start thinking, how, is, how are my eyes moving around the frame? because that's also part of it. The director is also directing you where to look next. And then, what about other elements that have not been considered so far? Is there anything particularly unusual about the camera angle, the lens work, the colors, that's telling us something? After this observation, it's very simple. You just simply say, what is he trying to tell me about the character, about the story, about the mood? 
is that consistent with my understanding of the film? A good director would have a kind of a coherent way of communicating these things. And it's a novice director will probably be a little bit more haphazard about it. In this scene, Ingrid Bergman is in the middle. She's the first thing we notice because she is in the middle. She's also the highest contrast, if you blur up the image. She's in the center. And she's actually taking up more space than the two other characters. She's looking towards us. We immediately catch her eyes and we connect with her. The others are actually looking away and very intentionally we're drawn to her, not to them. I haven't told you anything about what's happening in this film or which film it even is. So maybe you recognize it, maybe not. But we can read some stuff about this. The expression of her on her face alone is kind of telling there's something wrong, but there's more than that. They're not looking at us. There's a, an oblique angle here with those lines. That composition is intentionally done in a way that's not so fully balanced, or at least it's not directly balanced. It's not looking at the table straight from the side. Also, there are distances between them. There's a whole table between her and the guy. And the lady behind her, even though she's closer, but she has her back to her. So the relationship is obviously cold. And like I said, she's surrounded between these two. And if you look at the lines in the scene, and this is how our eyes are moving around, they always kind of rotate and bring us back to the middle. She's in a way surrounded. The lines are trapping her in every direction. And you've seen, if you've seen this movie, Notorious, you would know that she's a CIA undercover agent infiltrating a Nazi cell in Brazil, and they're secretly poisoning her in her coffee that she's drinking in this scene. At this point, the audience kind of understands that that's what's going on, but you can kind of get a sense that there's something wrong without really knowing anything about the story. So I tried to kind of put in terms, in similar terms, what I've been use, how I've been using this for UX. Um, so let's use the term maison page, which I later realized actually is a term that exists from print design. <laughs> it's about how you put words and text on the paper. But I'm extending it here to the idea that all the decisions that we do in, as user experience designers are for a reason. And you can look at them and interpret back, backwards what the content may be for, what the structure of the content may be is, what functionality is there, what, how we envision it to be used. And for the purposes of how I do things with the user, with their reviews, design reviews, I'm able to at least look at what's there, interpret what it means to me, assuming that the design is well thought out. And then I can take that into a conversation with the designers or the product owners and say, is this what you're trying to do? Tell me more about your user. Tell me more about your use case. And kind of get at it from that, from that angle. Size, again, this is very similar dimensions to the film. The map in Ford Go Bikes, it takes up the whole space. Because this is really what, you, it's all about where you are and where the parklet is. With Lyft, it's about where you are, where you're going to be picked up from, and where you're going. So it takes half the space. With Hotels.com, the map use case is secondary, so it's just a link or a button. <laughs> Again, size can draw attention to what's functionally most important. In the middle, you've got YouTube. This is my salsa review list. The play button is obviously what you most do with a playlist, so it's bigger than any other action. The current temperature, or the current temperature yesterday in Oakland, is larger than the temperature at any other time of the day or at the time of the week for a reason. Again, sim similarly, what's, just, what's selected in this Netflix interface is larger than everything else. It draws our attention to it. This is what the designer wants the user to notice. Well, just a caveat that sometimes the nature of the content itself dictates some space. For example, if you're editing a video and you've got a timeline, well, that's obviously a very short and long, or narrow and long thing. So it kind of dictates a very specific kind of space. That also tells you something about the content, the kind of the shape of the space it's allocated. Why does this keep happening? <laughs> <laughs> OK, I think that um, I keep pressing the button below. But anyways. Okay, so placement. Obviously, what's above is more important. If 
for Shazam, the Shazam link function is more important than the camera scan function. Um, in lists, be it a panel or a tab list, obviously the top is important because that's you know, where users typically start. But also the extreme position is important because our eyes can very quickly go to the end of a, of a tab collection or a bottom of a list. So that's why you typically find help and log out in these places because there's, there's, even though they're not the primary thing, but they're important enough and to be easy to find. Placement can be relative. There's an information architecture there. Things are not just arbitrarily placed. Where things are and which, in which order they are, they also imply something about the whole architecture of the content. So when you see something in one place, you have to relate it to what's around it. So if I'm buying something from Amazon, I obviously want to choose what I want to buy, then select my shoe size, and then go add it to my cart. This cannot happen in any other order. I mean, not logically. Distance. This is the most given, but also the one that I see most violated <laughs> with agile development. <laughs> it's a given that things are closer to each other, that are related to each other, and things that are not, they're not related to each other. But sometimes with agile, you just need to throw a button in somewhere, and you don't have time to relay out the page, so you just throw it at the bottom of one of these lists, and suddenly the user is confused, thinking it's somehow related. Not that it has anything to do with LinkedIn, that was just a random example. Layout tells you a lot also <laughs> um, about what is expected. L users are very familiar with layouts. They're familiar with how these things work. You've got a panel on the left, you've got content on the right. They kind of expect this. So when they see that kind of layout, you're establishing a certain expectation with the user. Uh, and also layouts come with lines. Our eyes very easily follow lines. So you've got a grid that kind of makes you move in every kind of direction. If you've got you know, three columns, your, your eyes are pushed to move in that direction. Color, obviously, would color communicate state, like green, red, I've obviously overeaten yesterday. Um, but also, it it's draws our attention. If you look at eBay, they, the buy it now is the darkest blue, are drawing the most attention to itself. It's darker than add to color, and that's not an arbitrary choice. They're trying to draw our attention to the purchase process, but in their preference from the perspective of their business. Movement. I consider movement not to be just animation, but actually any change in the image. Any change in the image, really. Um, even typing. Because if any change is happening visually, our eyes are drawn to it, and that is important. So movement has to be purposeful. If there's anything moving, then it shouldn't be. That's obviously distracting. Now what's happening? Here we go. And then obviously, just like a gun in a movie means something to everybody, a slider works a certain way. Users are familiar with these. And I see many times components being used for, in ways that are that not meant to be used. So depending on who I'm dealing with, if it's a designer, I kind of expect them to do the right thing. But if it's not a designer, I have to validate these things. Framing is very important. What's in the frame, what's not in the frame? Very much like in movies. What's in the frame is what you need to be paying attention to. What is not in the frame obviously is less important, but, but sometimes it's important to know that it's there. A lot of times you see interfaces where you're not even aware that it scrolls, for example. Um, but also I consider part of framing, what is the default state? So um, Airbnb's app auto scrolls to your next part of your trip or your last trip. That's not an obvious choice, that's a conscious choice. So knowing what the default is important. This Caltrain schedule defaults to my last search. So I don't have to specify the start station, the end station randomly. All of these things are obvious, but the idea that this is something to include in the thinking and it's part of framing is, is, uh, is the point here. Labels, that's also a given. Unlike in cinema where you just see a guy or a, or a lady in, in, in a frame and you kind of understand that they're characters, and in UX we have to deal with this idea that things have to be labeled. But I, I threw this in as an extra to have a complete logic to the whole uh, presentation. But again, how do you do this? The idea is very, very, very simple. First of all, what am I looking at? Just like in film, you're looking at characters, here you're looking at contents, functionalities, functions. They have to be labeled, they have to mean something. The context has to be provided and maintained. And then I also think, what is drawing my attention first? This is what is functionally most important, or at least 
likely to be most important. And again, it could be because it's given a prominent place, a distinguishing color, a particular contrast, or maybe it's animated. Something is drawing, me, drawing my attention to, to it first, so it better be most important. Then how are my eyes moving around? Are there too many colors that are just distracting me, or are they purposefully distracting me? Maybe that's okay. But if my eyes are moving around, better be for a reason, and it's clear why. Um, and of course, there may be other aspects that are particularly important. Uh, is there something about distance, size, movement that may not have been captured in the previous questions up here? Again, you basically, you start interpreting this back backwards. What is this telling me about the content? You know, what about the functionality? How is the user expected to use this? The layout alone can tell you a lot of things. Um, and then that becomes a basis for a conversation that I start having with the stakeholders, asking them, well, is this what you're trying to do? Is this who your user is? Is this how the user expected to use this? Again, I don't have time to look into all the research that's been done. Not ideal by any means. Not in any way am I you know, advocating this. However, I'm finding this very useful to at least engage in a conversation in a pinpointed way that can help move the reviews forward. This is kind of a summary of the dimensions that I just went through. Um, we don't need to go through this, but this kind of gives you a sense of the kind of questions I ask myself uh, as I'm doing this. Um, and my next steps is that I'm going to now start rolling out uh, a design process update within uh, IBM. And I'm going to select a few designers that I'm going to actually introduce. They have, I have not done it yet, but they will be introduced to this framework. And we're going to start kind of testing it and see how it works with them and enhancing it as it goes. Um, and I think, for me, the most important part of this, and I hope if I can get there, I could consider it an accomplishment, is to maintain the fun aspect. Because if I if you can make it fun, and if I can actually make reach the stakeholders, the non-designers that I work with, and give them a sense of this logic using a platform like Film that everybody can relate to, I think I would have accomplished something. So, thank you.